Um, my name is Ulf and I'm going to talk about continuous deployment of uh, IoT sensors. Um, first we're going to have a look at what what really is uh, continuous deployment but also why is it useful for embedded devices. Uh, and we're going to look we're going to look at the different parts of such a system uh, that, and the things you need in order to uh, to build it. Um, so I'm a software engineer at uh, Red Hat. I work in the Drog IoT uh, team, and that's a project which really uh, about is about creating these open source uh, components for building uh, an IoT solution. So we have all of this. You know, a lot of um, open source projects around building applications, uh, but you don't really have the, this end-to-end uh, -end story about uh, the device to the cloud to the applications consuming the, the data. So um, it's a collection of uh, components. Uh, one of them is a connectivity layer so that you can uh, uh, ingest events using several standard protocols. Um, it's a device management uh, registry so that you can manage the configuration of your devices and uh, do the provisioning and uh, store the credentials. Um, it's also a firmware uh, update service which we'll talk more about in this uh, talk. Uh, and we also have like a let's say toolkit for uh, writing firmware for a lot of um, popular microcontrollers. So with this we get this end-to-end -to -end, uh, uh, solution and um, hopefully um, you can use this to, to um, build your uh, system and not uh, reinvent the wheel. Um, so with that what's the what is uh, continuous uh, deployment. So I tend to think about it in uh, three different ways. So you have uh, continuous integration, which is the, uh, the like the shortest cycle of uh, testing that you have centrally in your team, uh, where you build uh, and you run some, maybe some simple, not too long tests, but uh, it depends really. Uh, and then you merge your changes and continues to do this so that you know that your system is working. Uh, then you have another step which is uh, the delivery step. Uh, and what, what that is is that you really add uh, the ability to create some releasable artifact from, um, from your stuff. So you can do this for every build but maybe it's not that um, necessary or uh, efficient to do that. So uh, the releasable artifact um, can, with that you can sort of deploy to a production system, uh, and that's what continuous deployment is in in at least in the my world, uh, where um, you take that the the that artifact and deliver it to uh, the production system. Um, so all in all, you have uh, these three these three different types of integration uh, and with the continuous deployment you can get this full end-to-end uh, -end, uh, uh, life cycle of um, you writing your application and ultimately it ends up on some device. So what sort of devices are we talking about? Um, we are talking about really tiny microcontrollers uh, in this case. Uh, with very little RAM and also very little storage. So this means that you have uh, very little facilities to do updates of your applications. Um, you basically need to build this into your application and we'll see how, how to do that um, later on. So why would you want to do continuous deployment of IoT sensors? After all it's not it's not like all IoT, all devices need to be connected, but those who are connected, um, they might have uh, bugs. So uh, you might want to fix that and 
Um, the idea is that by rolling out firmware updates, you, you fix uh, issues in your software. Um, there might also be non-critical or critical fixes, but there might not be bugs. It's just simply that the world is evolving around you. Maybe a root certificate needs to be updated and rolling out uh, firmware updates might be a way to do that uh, without uh, overcomplicating the um, the um, deployment pipeline. So you have this mutable firmware images that you deploy. So there's a lot of factors to consider when thinking about um, uh, continuous deployment of uh, sensors. One is that uh, it's a big risk, of course. Um, you may need to make sure that your firmware will work because if it doesn't, then the device can actually stop functioning and you have to perhaps send uh, someone on site to actually fix the device. So that's not, that's not uh, a great uh, solution if you have millions of devices uh, uh, delivered across the world. So that's, that's one, one uh, aspect. Another, another aspect of the risk is that a lot of the microcontroller software is written in C which has uh, a lot of pitfalls um, so you know you, you you really need to have a lot of testing um, you also need to think about resource usage for these types of devices because they're quite small uh, with uh, little ram little flash so um, uh, you need to consider that when you think about the size of your firmware, but also that you might need to have uh, two copies of it in order to um, swap them, which we'll, we'll talk about later, but uh, size and resource usage is important. Um, most IoT devices are connected in different ways, so uh, you have um, different bandwidth uh, restrictions depending on which uh, wireless technology you use um, you might your device might not have the uh, capacity to actually retrieve the firmware updates uh, in one big, big swoop so um, you might need to spread it out um, and finally um, the tooling for um, for building uh, like a continuous deployment pipeline um, for there, there's nothing like that's tailored to embedded, but um, we might be able to reuse some of the existing open source tooling that's that's out there in order to uh, to um, avoid reinventing the the whole thing. So how do you re reduce risk? Um, you need to do automated testing on uh, your device, ideally. Um, you also need to be able to roll back to a previous version of the firmware because if you can do that, then you can um, always try again later. Uh, and um, um, that really allows you to, uh, rather than preventing errors from happening, it allows you to plan for them to happen. Uh, and this might be a more robust uh, approach uh, longer term. And as I mentioned, uh, programming languages might have something to say as well. Uh, you can use uh, a language like uh, Rust, uh, which is what we like to use uh, because it eliminates a big, uh, big chunk of the um, um, possible bugs that you can have in your uh, firmware. And uh, programming language also matters for the resource usage um, because you, you can uh, you can't have a big runtime uh, for your language if you're going to uh, run this on a on a microcontroller. Uh, and uh, for the connectivity, there are a lot of different options. There you have um, like Wi-Fi or Ethernet. They are both. Uh, a lot more power hungry than the alternatives um, and you have these let's say uh, small network protocols like thread or bluetooth which require an additional gateway in order to connect to um, 
the uh, firmware update services uh, or you might have some long range um, system that might already have gateways deployed like LoRaWAN or, or uh, uh, via your uh, telco provider. So they all have different trade-offs but um, for instance with LoRaWAN there's a limit on how much airtime you get for your device so you won't be able to consume firmware that quickly. Let's say you have uh, 64 kilobytes of firmware if that if you're using a publicly available uh, things network gateway and account then uh, you will spend four days doing uh, that firmware update which might be fine but it's something to think about and finally we have all of this tooling right for building regular applications we run them we can run them on kubernetes we can uh, build uh, the applications using tecton pipelines uh, we can store the the um, artifacts uh, in the container registries and that's that's a lot of things that is just there for regular applications but it would be nice to be able to use that for embedded as well so how are we going to do that um, so let's start with uh, the sensor the um, the lowest level in the stack. So the sensor firmware needs to be able to roll back to previous versions, which means we need to have some component, which is a bootloader to load the application. So it loads the, um, the primary active application, uh, but you reserve some space in your uh, device so that you can store an updated application and then it's the bootloader's responsibility of switching between them and then persisting some kind of state to know if the firmware is uh, good or not. Like if, if it tries to run the new firmware and it doesn't work, it needs to make it sure that it can r uh, load the previous one before allowing it to be overwritten. And the, the way we've done this in our uh, system uh, is that uh, we have a very minimal bootloader that it's only able to swap these images it doesn't support any networking so all the all the process of retrieving the firmware is done by the application itself but using a, a, a library that we provide and the advantage of this is that you can con your application can continue to function while the firmware update is uh, being downloaded which might be important if you're taking four, four days to, to download it. So um, uh, so that's that's the like the bottom uh, layer of it. Um, some devices need a gateway as well, which we won't cover here. We just assume that there is some gateway uh, deployed. And finally, on the on the cloud side, the uh, events from the uh, um, from the device comes to the cloud uh, via the uh, draw cloud connectivity layer um, and you can use this um, protocol endpoints in um, uh, uh, like M HTTP, MQTT or CoAP to send events to, to draw cloud um, and you can report the firmware, current firmware status from, from the devices. So when the device reports its firmware status, um, it get it gets sent to the um, to the protocol endpoints, which stores the it checks the authentication in the device registry, and then it stores these telemetry events in the Kafka itself, and then the uh, consumer applications consume these events using. Kafka directly or via some integrations that the, the connectivity layer provides like MQTT or WebSockets um, and the nice thing about this is that the applications don't have to care about how the data gets from the device they can just consume it and the device don't really need to care about which application is consuming the device um, 
So the applications uh, can be anything from a serverless function to a digital twin system to uh, actually a firmware uh, update service, which uh, is what we'll demonstrate here. Um, you can use DrogCloud to manage devices and gateways. Um, it has a REST API and, and it also a, um, a console. So with this you can manage, uh, you can group your uh, devices into uh, applications and you can also have a gateway that is registered to, uh, to serve a given device. So ultimately you can do provisioning uh, with this as well. Uh, for firmware updates, we have made um, a delivery and build system called Drog Azure. Uh, this system is just like any other application, but it uses Drog Cloud as the connectivity layer. Um, and the advantage of that is that you, it automatically gets support for all the different protocols that the connectivity layer supports for the devices. So ultimately it means it can deliver firmware updates over MQTT, HTTP, CoAP, or uh, LoRaWAN, which is really nice. Um, it uses a special, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a, a small type of message using the CBOR encoding, uh, which m allows the device to minimize the bandwidth it needs in order to send this update. So the device sends updates to the firmware delivery service about its current firmware and then the delivery service sends back uh, a, a message saying you're up to date uh, or it sends a next firmware blob. Uh, so the nice thing with this is that the, um, the update service doesn't really need to care where in the process each device is. It's, it's up to the device what it wants to fetch next. Um, and um, the delivery service can fetch the firmware from different sources. One is Eclipse Hawkbit, um, which is a, another open source project uh, that is specializes on, on uh, managing firmware and scheduling updates and so on. Um, but we've also been playing around with the, the idea of storing firmware in container images so that we can reuse um, all of the uh, mechanisms that, that exist for other cloud native applications. Um, using a uh, build service and combining it with uh, the Tekton pipelines. Um, so that's that's really um, what the update service is. Um, it has a console, so you can uh, get an overview of your application devices and your current builds. Um, you can also see the progress of each uh, device. And the information about the progress is stored in the Drogue Cloud uh, device management system. So you can also get that using REST APIs. And, and uh, if you're familiar with Kubernetes resources, it, it, it follows a similar schema to the, uh, to the data. You can also uh, trigger builds from this uh, console. So if you have a build uh, section specified in your firmware, which we'll see later, um, you can actually um, see, you can actually trigger the builds from here. So, uh, and with that, let's, let's do a demo of the uh, entire system. So uh, what we're going to do is to have a, a micro bit connected to a gateway which can be anything from a Raspberry Pi Pico or uh, a more powerful thing. Um, and the gateway forwards these events to Drog uh, IoT. Uh, the Drog IoT it runs in the cloud. Um, it uh, uses a container registry for storing the firmware updates. And we also use the Tekton pipelines to build uh, the firmware. So um, with that, let's um, go to the demo. So in this uh, demo, we're going to use the um, Drogue uh, IoT mm, sandbox. This is a public service which you can use to um, uh, build your IoT uh, system. 
it it's basically contains the connectivity layer so that you can send devices send the data from devices with uh, HTTP, MQTT, CoAP, or even LoRaWAN, um, and you can run applications on your own servers that connect to this to consume the events. So it's very much like a, a broker or a, an Apache Kafka instance, but with um, some additional, um, uh, let's say, uh, services on top um, for device management, authentication, and also uh, the ability to integrate with the other uh, services like the Things Network. It runs on an OpenShift cluster and uses um, a uh, managed Apache Kafka instance um, from uh, Red Hat. So um, you can free to use this. Uh, you can also run Drogue IoT on your own, of course. It's an open source project, and um, it might, but it might be easier to you know try it out this way for the first time. Um, so we can log in to the console, and we're, what we're going to do is uh, create a device in the registry for our micro bit here and then we're also going to specify how to build the firmware for it and then trigger a build uh, and eventually deliver that firmware to the micro bit while it's operating uh, reporting temperature and so on as uh, as normal so uh, let's start by creating the device um, we'll uh, use the command line for it uh, we can also use the browser, but there's some functionality that you need to use the command line for. Um, so we're going to start with that um, here, and then move to the terminal. There, and then we have the ability to create the device. Uh, let's have a look at what the device looks like um, in the browser. Uh, we can find our device here and then we have uh, a special section in the device configuration which uh, is about how uh, we deliver firmware for the device so in this case we're going to store firmware in container images just like regular applications uh, and then we're going also going to build it using uh, Tekton pipelines um, just like re regular applications and whenever the te pipeline is finished running it will also um, publish the um, uh, firmware to the internal registry on the OpenShift cluster and uh, deliver that use that to deliver firmware to the devices um, yes and then now that we have uh, the devices ready we can also Go and trigger the build, uh, which we'll do. Um, so we have uh, the firmware console, which you can use to do that. In the firmware console, we have an overview of the devices. Um, you can see that our micro bit is not yet in a known state because we haven't really uh, started it up. So what we have is a new version of the firmware already uh, ready to be built. So we're just going to build that. Uh, and then I'm going to edit the um, firmware and uh, run the um, uh, build locally to, um, to make sure that we have uh, something that we can see the change of. So in our initial version here, we're going to flash it or which means programming the bootloader and the um, and the uh, Bluetooth uh, driver and uh, our application so that the app micro bit will blink with the letter A. Uh, and our firmware built uh, will be built from the GitHub um, repository, which will um, cause it to blink uh, B once it's updated. Uh, but in order to do that, we need the gateways in order to deliver the um, uh, firmware to um, the cloud. Uh, to deliver the firmware to the device, sorry. Uh, and we're going to look at the browser again and see that our build is running. Um, 
Uh, we also have uh, the device reporting its uh, state eventually, and we can also look at the temperature data from the device. So it might take some time before the, um, the system um, will report the status. So there we have the temperature being reported. Um, and uh, even <laughs> it seems like it's very hot air, but it's because it's uh, the unit is really, uh, um, you need to divide it by 10 in order to get the um, actual temperature. This is in order to save space uh, within a single byte. Uh, so the temperature is being reported in a special channel named foo. Um, uh, we have channels are the way to multiplex uh, data streams on top of uh, uh, the, the, the topics in uh, Kafka and we can use this to have a special channel for the firmware updates. Now we can see it's reporting the current firmware uh, <coughs> state of the device. Uh, we can also see that the build has uh, succeeded now, so we can actually um, uh, we can actually um, see that the, the the device is receiving the firmware updates from the system uh, eventually. So we can see it's uh, updated live here, uh, and the target version is basically the Git revision, and. Um, this is basically sending updates over the connectivity layer as uh, commands to the device, which goes via the gateway, which goes back to the device uh, using these GET services. And while this is happening, you can still see that the temperature is being reported from the device. So it's doing normal operation while performing the update over the DFU channel. If you remember, um, I mentioned that when the device is updated, fully updated, it will print the blink the letter B instead. Um, and the reason for that is that in the source code we have um, committed that it's going to display B, but locally we have just flashed it to display the letter A, just to see notice that there is a difference. depending on your device bandwidth, this is going to be much faster or much slower. Um, the device is actually the one determining with the block size of each update. So if you have a device that can receive larger batches of firmware in one go, your device can, do, can report that when it's reporting its firmware status, it also says which block size it supports so that mm, you can sort of let the device decide uh, the speed of the uh, update because ultimately there is some delay between you know receiving the blocks but uh, it's also considering uh, that devices might take a lot of time to update so it's not it's not about getting the delivery as fast as possible it's getting it as reliable as possible so now it's updated you can see it stopped blinking because um, uh, it's now actually swapping the firmware and it's actually re rebooted and now it's blinking the letter B instead. Um, the update progress has 100 because it haven't reported uh, a successful boot yet. That's going to happen soon, hopefully. We can see if it starts reporting temperature. Yes, so now the device is functioning as expected. Uh, reporting uh, temperature to um, service. And we can also see it reported something on the DFU channel, which means it got synced. So now the, our device is in a synced state. Uh, and we've delivered our uh, first firmware update to it. And now we can, you know, make new changes, trigger the pipeline using the console if you want to, but also using REST API. So we can sort of build automation into this and build a 
full continuous delivery pipeline. So with that, let's take a look at uh, what we just saw. Uh, we had uh, our device, uh, which in our case was talking Bluetooth via a gateway uh, that were sending firm uh, temperature readings, but also firmware status updates uh, to the Drogue IoT uh, connectivity layer. Um, and the connectivity layer stores that in uh, Kafka, and then the firmware delivery service receives those events by consuming from Kafka and um, essentially it looks at the status of the firmware, compares it with what's uh, stored in the uh, firmware um, uh, storage and then sends back uh, either a OK, you are up to date, uh, or it sends uh, the next firmware blob that the device should write or um, it tells the device that your update is complete you may uh, proceed to reset and uh, switch the firmwares. Um, we've seen that in this case we used a container registry to uh, store the firmware but you can also use other registries if you wish um, this is very similar to how uh, you know applications running uh, in containers uh, that are not embedded um, are developed uh, are um, built and deployed as well. So it's a lot very similar to that uh, flow. Um, we also saw how the the build service, which we triggered using uh, the REST API, basically uh, creates. Uh, Tecton pipeline uh, uh, builds that build the firmware using a builder image and then publishes it to the internal registry of the um, of the uh, firmware storage. And once the device, uh, once the new firmware was available, the device started updating it via the gateway, and at the end the um, delivery service instructed the device to switch and it came up reporting the new version which uh, was in sync with uh, what is stored in the um, uh, firmware storage. So that's the whole end-to-end -end. and keep in mind that the, all of this was happening while the application was also reporting temperature and functioning as normal. Um, you can also use this with uh, uh, direct Wi-Fi uh, devices or uh, using LoRaWAN um, or any other technology that allows you to talk to drogue uh, connectivity endpoints because the, um, the protocol itself is layered on top of those uh, or the update protocol itself is layered on top of those uh, transport different transports so um, that's a nice um, kind of uh, feature that we get for free by uh, running this on top of the connectivity layer. It can be slow, uh, uh, like if you fetch the firmware directly, of course, it, and it would have been a lot faster, but um, this way the device themselves um, determine uh, how fast they consume the update and that's really nice when you have a big fleet of devices that might have different capabilities. They might have uh, different uh, connectivity uh, and so on. So it's really important to be able to to uh, uh, roll out uh, firmware gradually and uh, independently of uh, each other. Um, so to recap this uh, presentation, uh, we've seen how we've re reduced risk by uh, introducing uh, the ability to roll back in, uh, in the device firmware. Uh, we're using a bootloader for that and an active passive partition. It's a very similar to the, like this AB testing that you get with uh, 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 regular applications, but it, it's uh, not running both firmwares at the same time, of course. Um, the um, uh, device was connected using Bluetooth in our demo, but uh, with Drogue uh, 
uh, cloud, you can connect any device. Uh, you can also easily integrate with, uh, you know, different uh, uh, third-party services. Like we have uh, an integration with uh, LoRaWAN, um, the Things Network, and you can build easily build your own applications that integrate with um, a legacy system or um, uh, uh, any third-party system that you might have. Um, we've uh, been using open source tooling, of course. You've seen Kubernetes, you've seen uh, uh, and OpenShift, and you've seen uh, Apache Kafka, Postgres, uh, Keycloak, and uh, Tekton. So it's really about gluing this together and uh, uh, providing the right abstractions for, uh, for IoT. Um, you can try this uh, demo yourself, the repository uh, you saw in the, um, uh, in the demo and also you can use the public sandbox as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's freely available. Um, in order to play with firmware updates, we've had to restrict uh, this on a per user basis because otherwise you could potentially uh, use a custom uh, Bitcoin mining uh, builder image. Um, so we don't want that. So if you want to play with firmware updates, uh, get in touch with us and uh, we can uh, help you out with that. Um, and um, yeah, you can go to the uh, these URLs um, to just log in with your GitHub IDs and uh, you should have examples there in order to get started. And if you go to our website, there's a lot of uh, documentation there on how to use our APIs, how to deploy Drogo IoT yourself, uh, but also how to use these command line utilities or uh, and even firmware updates and, and things like that. Uh, for the device side, we have uh, are working with the Rust embedded community to to create uh, an ecosystem with drivers and uh, um, and uh, examples that that work, but uh, you should be able to work with any use Drogue Cloud with any uh, type of device as long as it, it, it talks the uh, open standard protocols. And uh, that's it. Thank you for watching.